thanks for being here, volunteers, staff, thanks for coming. Um, in case you haven't met Kelsey yet, Kelsey is here. She was our uh, summer intern in the curatorial department. Her internship is about to end, sadly, this week is her last week. Um, but she's got some really great stuff to tell us about today with some um, updates of labels and all kinds of great stuff. So, Kelsey, take it away. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everybody. Or good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Already ahead of myself. Good morning, everybody. I really want to thank all of you for taking the time to be here this morning and also for the opportunity that I had during this internship. So today I'll be speaking about a few pieces in the permanent collection and highlighting an alternate perspective. I have the utmost respect for all the time and dedication and research and work that every single one of you have put into your tours and to speaking and interacting with the volunteers. So this is, my intention for this training is to just build upon work you've already done and to build upon the work that the previous and current cur cur curatorial team is already working on. The packets that I'll have in the volunteer office and in Rachel's office include important terms, articles, and open-ended questions that you can ask visitors when you have a tour to talk to them about really relevant and complex issues. There's been a major shift in 21st century museums. Museums are changing what they display, how they display it, and how they interpret the work. The depth and breadth of this collection is really important, was really important for me to interpret the wildlife artists as figures in history and not as figures of their own myths. As an educational institution and using some of our values, it's incredibly important for us to be transparent about the artists that we, display, we present and present a plurality of truths. For example, John James Audubon not only relied on killing birds and using their taxidermy bodies in natural positions for the birds of America, he also benefited, benefited from the information and the collection of specimens by enslaved black people and indigenous peoples. Instead of recognizing their efforts and their contributions to his own work, he, re he recounted and called them as hands of white people traveling with him. By omitting terms like racist and exoticized, we invalidate the lived experience and ultimately perpetuate the erasure of people's histories. Words are important for people's understanding of the exhibitions and its impact. The NWMA is incredibly unique not only because of the beautiful artwork we have on display, it's also unique because every one of us here has the opportunity to discuss relevant and critical topics through human, humanity's connection to wildlife. I wanted to start with Bierstadt. So in 1860, Albert Bierstadt said that Yosemite was America's Garden of Eden, and he depicted it untouched by human hands. But was it? Was it really? There were ancestral lands that had been there for millennia, had been erased. So what, does it, the pur what purpose does it serve to erase indigenous presence by representing empty land void of human influence? By representing empty land, these paintings er erase the reality of indigenous presence. Ancestral lands, <laughs> Ancestral lands, I'm only a little nervous, <laughs> that have been <laughs> occupied for millennia become inaccessible to non-white bodies. Pristine American landscapes reinforce the myth of the pastoral frontier, a romanticized concept of a place that exists outside of settler colonialism's violence. So when we look at these, we need to understand and make sure that the visitors understand that this concept of a place that is idyllic, romantic, sweeping vistas is a false reality that they painted for their upper wealthy class patrons. Moving to Hicks, 
in his peaceable kingdom, when looking at artwork featuring indigenous peoples, consider who is depicting whom. What stereotypes may be reinforced? Whose voice or story is missing? In the peaceable kingdom, it is the represent, representation of peace on earth. But re, in the reality of this situation is the Lenny Lenape people signed the treaty with Penn, and in less than a decade later, his sons Thomas and John cheated the peop the, these exact peoples out of thousands of acres of land. That's a plurality of truth that I'm talking about. While this is an idyllic representation of, and hopeful representation of what they wanted America to be, it wasn't in fact the reality. And moving over here to some of the works with what looks like a nuclear family, paintings like this reinforce the idea of heteronormativity. And heteronormativity is the false belief or assumption that heterosexuality is the only natural, quote unquote, expression of sexuality. In, sci in science, we know that over 500 species of birds, mammals, insects, and reptiles do not follow heteronormative traditions in courtship, parenting, bonding. So it's important for the visitors to understand that yes, this was part of the time, a representation of the time, but really what it's representing is the erasure of the LGBTQIA people. Does anybody have any questions about some of the terms or concepts that I've brought up in this specific gallery? Kelsey, I have a, I have yeah. a question. So, so I love what you're doing and, and kind of opening up our minds to think of this artwork in a different way. Yes. And same for the visitors as well. Yes. So what, are you suggesting or advocating that we could, you know, keep these works displayed as is, but add some interpretive, yes. additional interpretive Absolutely. information to Absolutely. help people to understand what they're looking at? And, yeah. And, and I, I loved what you said about whose perspective is it and who's missing. Yeah. These are all questions to keep in mind when you're looking at this artwork. Yes? Um, now, just to clarify, are you saying deer do not exist in nuclear families? They do not. <laughs> <laughs> they do not exist in nuclear families. Um, but to answer Jane's question, absolutely. I am not in any way uh, insisting that artworks be taken down, just reinterpreted and represented with these pluralities of truths. You can look at John James Audubon and see what he did for ornithology, but also understand the fact and educate people on the fact that he also enslaved people. Those are two things that exist at the exact same time. It doesn't negate the other. Some people may judge him on that, which by all means, that's you know not a, a black mark on his, his life, but at the same time, it's not discrediting the things that he did give us in the meantime. It's just giving people the different and alternate perspectives so they understand the full truth of him as a person and a figure in history, and not just the myth of him being the, bir the you know, godfather of ornithology. He was also a man. And like most of us, you know, we need to learn from our mistakes and learn from the past grievances that we that has happened in American history. And I will answer, in answer to Kelsey's question, I walked my dog this morning up on the side of Snow King, and I saw exactly that doe and her two spotted fawns, and my dog was very good and did not chase them. <laughs> the buck was nowhere to be seen. There we go. He was in my yard. <laughs> Now I'd like to move over to the Gilcrease Gallery and talk about some of the paintings in the European collection. 
So when looking at Paul Whelan Bartlett, it's identified on the icon card as a bohemian, when really they're the Ursari people who are part of the Romani people, and they were bear leaders and bear trainers that date back all the way to the 12th century. So in the packets that you'll have, you'll be able to have these names and terms to use when speaking about works like this. Because it's important for us to identify the people as they are represented, not as a European representation of them. The real reality of it is, is that Bohemian is a Western term that's one step above gypsy. So when you research them and work on, when I was researching this piece, they're actually a type of pe Romani people that date back to Byzantium. So it's important, if you do talk about this piece, to use the correct terminology also for that. Also, Czechoslovakia was yes. called Bohemia because my grand great-grandfather came from there. So um, it's the Czech Republic. Yes, it is now the Czech Republic, and it's important to state, the, thank you, Tammy, it's important to state the present-day countries as well. Here, Jerome's work, he embarked on numerous trips to the Eastern Mediterranean in the Middle East, and his paintings contain visual examples of Orientalism. Orientalism was an artistic movement and a cultural construct that resulted from imperialism, tourism, and settler colonialism in the 19th century. And while this is a fantastical piece, where we all have, I think many of you, which I've heard some of your tours have talked about, that cranes and tigers would not exist in this landscape. Looking at the frame and understanding the fact that most of his pieces did come, stem from Orientalism is also important to know the movement behind it. These were cultural constructs of the quote-unquote Orient or the East that were created by Western Europeans which also categorizes those people as the other, and that's something that we want to make sure that people understand has been a false <laughs> and <clears throat> unacceptable term in this day and age. What I think is cool about this piece is that the, um, the eye of that Siberian tiger is yes. the same color as the ocean behind It is true, mm. yes, that is also true. It tells you one thing about yeah. the Bohemian Bear. Yes. Well, I, think, I believe that's the title of the piece. It is. It's so, by the artist. It is. So in the, in this case, we don't obviously we can't change the title, but we could add in diff, some additional yes. interpretation Absolutely. explaining that that title is right. misleading or yes. Or say that that story. was the title of the that was the title the artist gave at the time, uh -huh. but in reality, it's based off of these real people that were bear leaders right. and bear trainers yeah. that, that date back be, to the 12th that century. That would be good information to include. Oh, and yes. I, Jane, could uh -huh. we include that because uh, some of the docents don't know that the crocodile uh -huh. here is a new addition oh, that is. Lizzie or did this nice arrangement with, and is also a Bartlett piece. Um, same artist, same artist. as that. So, I'm glad wow. you pointed that out because I saw the social media and I thought, yeah. where is yeah. that? Yeah, that's something we need to announce today. So, wow. Okay, and moving to the Kunert. So, when I first read the label for the Wilhelm Kunert, something stood out pretty quickly. On this label, it states that he traveled to German East Africa. What it doesn't state is that that is present-day Tanzania, Burundi, Rwanda, and parts of Mozambique. By not including present-day countries and leaving German East Africa, we reinforce the idea that these colonies still exist, perpetuating the erasure of colonial violence. It's, in, it's essential to inform visitors that he actively participated, benefited, and profited from German colonialism. His sketches on these expeditions define the Western conception of Africa and African nature in the colonial era. We would not have these pieces of his work of African animals had it not been for German colonialism. And that's really important to state that 
and it's really important that people know and understand that. And I have one last piece. I promise this is the last time I'll make you move. But did I, does anybody have any questions for this gallery or anything that I've talked about? No? And you'll have more information, again, in the packets. I have a really wonderful article about the importance of language in 21st century museums, a really amazing article by Dr. Raywin Grant on black bears and black liberation, and you can use that for the bears exhibit coming up in the fall, and also another example of rectifying pasts from the Audubon Society talking about John James Audubon. So you'll have that information as well. So the last piece I wanted to discuss today was Borglum's The Mares of Diomedes. Known as the sculptor of Mount Rushmore, what is less known is that he was a white supremacist and an active one at that. This unique bronze cast uses Greek mythology to not only glorify masculinity and whiteness, both of which become synonymous with, white, with Western civilization. And in this instance, we have this piece up, and it's important, again, I keep saying that, but it's imperative in the hierarchy of language that we identify him not only for his triumphs, but for his falters. Racists should not and cannot get a pass anymore just because of the artwork they produce. So we, as educators and as people, who interpret the galleries and talk to people in the galleries. If you come across this piece, it is incredibly, what's the right word? <laughs> it's essential to identify him also as a white supremacist. We need to use this type of language regularly. We need to identify it and we need to acknowledge it. And it's not to cause harm but it's to educate people on, again, the plurality of him being a known sculptor for American patriotism, <clears throat> but also having the underlying thoughts, feelings, and actions of a white supremacist. And that, <laughs> thought I'd end it with a bang, <laughs> is where I end this. I have a question. Of course. Um, just being sensitive to the different groups that we have through of course. there. Mm -hmm. Is there other language, are you going to give us other language, other language skills that we can use? Maybe, I don't know if, I mean, if I already say this man was a white supremacist, if that's going to turn off my audience, I mean, where's the middle ground or, well, I mean, it doesn't turn me off at right. all, but I'm just saying like, because we have such a I, there is, I will make command. sure that there is a way that you can explain that term mm -hmm. in regards to him and this object mm -hmm. that hopefully will not turn people off. Does anybody else feel that way? Or yes, I, I wanted to yeah. follow up on that. In, in no way am I trying to challenge what yeah. you're saying, but I guess what evidence is there? Like, do you have journals of yes. this artist that yes. where he's yes. specifically yes. saying, yes. got yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there is language that the problem is, is the, this idea of neutrality and mm -hmm. museums not taking sides mm -hmm. and making sure to not be political mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not to rock the boat. Mm -hmm. And those days within the last year after the murders of George mm -hmm. Floyd and Breonna Taylor, they really have changed. Right. And me, a lot of museums are identifying people mm -hmm. not only by their successes, but by information like this. Mm -hmm. And there will be some people that are turned off by that language, mm -hmm. absolutely. But they're not going to just hear it here, is part but of the not, point. They're, they're, they're not going to just yeah. hear it here, and it's important that they, they hear those specific words. Mm -hmm. There are ways to talk about it and discuss it and have an open and constructive conversation with people mm -hmm. to hopefully give them a broader understanding of that term and what mm -hmm. it means. But it's still really important for people to understand and hear those words exactly. Mm -hmm. So How does that apply to this particular piece of art? This particular piece of art and this particular artist, yes. I had no idea. So I can, I can ha there, that might happen. 
and mm -hmm. but it's well, museums are changing Kelsey, yeah. too that we are also looking at the artwork or what the artwork is and we have to remember mm -hmm. that too yeah when you get into modernism and when you get into <clears throat> contemporary art there's a lot of scholars that are writing about death of the authors the biography of the artist doesn't really make that big of an impact when you're representing um you know um say andrew jackson who did a lot of horrible things yeah um, and that person is in the, the, the piece, that is something I think that is a little bit different. Right. I don't know how much Borglum put, you know, his racism into this piece, how much we have to acknowledge that. If that's something, I don't know, if that's something that the audience, yeah, they can be made aware of. Yeah, but we have to think about what, how we're interpreting the art, right. how he was interpreting the art in that time period. Too. Yeah. And it was 1904. Right. It was. Right. 19, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was 1904. But he was yeah. one that also yeah. added in the statements that he made about this piece exactly, saying that it was, you know, the human condition conquering. What he stated when he made this piece, it was it was changed three separate times. It was a cowboy first, mm -hmm. it was a indigenous Native American second, where he said that he removed the feather and the g-string and then made it Hercules. So there is, in fact, details of parts, maybe not the whole concept of his racism, but parts of them when it comes to this specific piece of artwork. Mm -hmm. And that is why I thought it was important to talk mm -hmm. about it today. Kelsey, you were going to say something? Yes, um, I think it is very important that we talk about the full context of the art that we display here. And in response to your comments about is there a way that we can be more you know, user friendly to the people that we're talking to, I think it's important that we normalize using the correct language. Uh, there's no need to sugarcoat white supremacy. You don't need to be gentle with <laughs> it did really, really harmful things, and if we are silent and if we gloss over, we are perpetuating that harm, we're excusing it, we're saying, you know, I, I know, but he made a really pretty sculpture. Mm -hmm. So it's saying, okay, this whole group of people that were victimized are less important than this sculpture. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's about telling the whole story, and I think that it's really important that we are honest. And then comparing and contrasting the Mount Rushmore. Mm -hmm. With this piece, mm -hmm. and we have the yeah. you know the, the photograph of Mount Rushmore over here, and understanding that he was very intrinsic in that representation, and also intrinsic in this. Yes, and and then have right. let people think about it themselves. Yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Giving people the opportunity to understand the full truth of not only the artist but of the sculpture of the time gives them the opportunity to reflect and think and constructively criticize or completely omit, if they choose to, mm -hmm. what's actually going on. But as an educational institution, it's really, as Kelsey stated, and I couldn't have said it better myself, um, it's important that we not omit those terms any longer. We've omitted them, museums have omitted them for decades, if not centuries, and it's important <laughs> that we make those shifts towards not omitting terms like that anymore. And I think it's important to note that we are not the first institution mm -hmm. to say these things, mm -hmm. and it is documented, so you don't mm -hmm. have to feel like you're making an opinion statement, mm -hmm. which could be hard, because if they wanted to go and challenge or look it up, it's not like those resources don't exist. Because mm -hmm. I know sometimes it might feel hard to give an opinion when mm -hmm. this has been researched and documented. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think Buffalo Bill gave their back. No, totally. I'm totally supportive of it. I just didn't want somebody to come and complain to Rachel that that yeah, yeah. bitchy that. dose. She can blame it on me. She <laughs> was like, it was the intern. Well, and I think too, it's, it's important to remember. I mean, I think I think like you said, or so, you know, like we're all thinking. If if we say to a tour, mm -hmm. this artist was a white supremacist, that can be hard for some people to hear. Right. But at the same time, if a visitor comes in here. Mm -hmm who knows this about this artist and sees <laughs> and brings no it mention up. of it, right. Right. it's making that visitor feel 
it's unseen, harmful, unheard. Yeah. Or they bring it up and then the docent is thrown off guard and is like, I don't know how to respond to that. Right. The whole idea is that you as a docent can learn kind of what to say to to bring them down a little bit and say, well, this is why we have it on display. This is why it's important to our collection, but we do recognize this. Um, and and I think uh, as a docent, reading your audience comes into play a little bit too. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. then yeah. you might be able to tell pretty easily if somebody is uncomfortable with the piece you're in front of for yeah. any reason, whether it's against it or for it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Good. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> So what is your recommendation for us as an institution in terms of next steps? I mean, obviously, docents are here, and they're hearing ways to talk about different pieces of art, artwork and, yeah. and add more information right. for our visitors. But what about you know adding, like we talked about, adding more information, interpretive information to labels? Yep. I would say that that's a great next step. I also think that um, having, I've created a really uh, in-depth folder of DEI resources, DEAI resources, and I sent that to Steve. So I think making sure all the docents and volunteers have access to that when you know Steve goes through it and then you know goes through all those resources and having external people and some, at some point in time come in and give those other sorts of trainings about language and this is just scratching the surface. Um, but there are definitely more than a few really significant next steps the museum can take. And really, with all of you and you interacting with the visitors on the front lines and firsthand, it begins with all of you. 